Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lenore von Stein, and this is an episode of The Facts. The Facts is a, a show that has uh, modern music and episodes of discussion. Episodes of discussion. This is one of those episodes. And today we're talking to Michael Parenti, uh, who's a political scientist and an author. And among his recent books are um, uh, the uh, Waiting for Yesterday, Pages from a Street Kid's Life. And it's his, a memoir uh, of his uh, growing up in, in Harlem, in New York City. We're talking from New York City. Uh, his website is www.parenti.org, where you can read more about this very interesting man. And there's, a, the, there's another book, The Face of Imperialism, among the new books, but he's written many books. Um, and I've read a few of them, and they're really very enjoyable and, and useful and, and good reads. Um, so thank you, Michael, for being on The Facts and joining us tonight. Um, can, uh, let me ask you a question. Um, how does the relation between wealth and poverty, uh, how does wealth create poverty? Well, I've made that point that wealth does create poverty. Um, uh, <clears throat> The um, whenever you see wealth next to poverty, people will say, "Isn't that terrible? This unfortunate juxtaposition. Here, are these few people way on the top of the hills with so much wealth, living in such luxury, and here's the massive shanty town in such poverty. And it's just seen as an unfortunate juxtaposition. Isn't that just something too bad? Why can't we give a little more charity to these people?" But the truth is, there's a very dynamic, there's a very dynamic connection between the two. That is, the wealthy are those who uh, expropriate the resources, uh, the wealth of the land. They expropriate the wealth of the labor. They 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 get rich off your labor by by paying you much much less than you produce in your work itself. So, and the more the more they can do that, the more they can they can uh, uh, accumulate the surplus, the value that's created by workers and such, the more they will have and the less that you will have. And so, um, and then the state itself services the wealthy. Uh, and, and, and when that works, when that works smoothly, you have a very successful capitalist country. For instance, one of the most successful capitalist countries is Indonesia, uh, as say compared to to Sweden or Finland or those countries. In 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 the, in the social democracies, you find that the very rich have to pay more in taxes. They um, a, a larger portion of their expropriation, their earnings, go back to the workers. The workers have four or five weeks of of paid vacations, uh, worker homes that they could go to, places like that. Um, but in a country like Indonesia, capitalism works in its purest form. There are no regulations. There are no human services. There, there are no hospital plans or health insurances. If you are sick and you're poor, you just die. Um, if you want hospital aid, you've got to pay for every little thing. That, uh, that that you might be able to get and the hospitals are often very run down and not very uh, well kept regularly there are bus plunges because the buses are not checked they're not they're not uh, fixed for according to safety traffic safety standards uh, so you have bus plunges well who rides the buses poor people who ride the buses to get to jobs or looking for jobs or whatever they're having to do um, and there's no there's no regulations there's no there's no human services there's no public schools if your kid if you can't afford to buy uh, some some education your kid doesn't go to school he hangs out in the streets if you look at Jakarta in Indonesia and you've got hundreds of mosques all over the city there's not a single park where kids can play in the park and such. That, those areas have been taken up by building all these mosques. Keep the people busy praying to some imaginary god uh, rather than organizing themselves against the terrible conditions that they have to live in. So that's how you do it. Now, here's something else. 
that we should keep in mind. The number of people living in poverty throughout the world today is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. So poverty is spreading. As wealth accumulates, and it accumulates in greater and greater accumulations, so does then poverty spread. And that's what we're facing. And now, now they brought it home to America. The goal, the goal here is not um, social democracy of the kind we, we talked about in my last interview with you. The goal is not a, a country where the ordinary people can live this what they call mid middle class style of life and all. The goal is to keep people down and out. The, the hungrier I can make you, the less you, you earn, the harder you will work for less and less. And that's what the goal is. Do you think if, if uh, I mean, do you think we're moving, uh, aside from these other places we're moving to, to, to where people have a better understanding of the relationship between wealth and poverty, that they're, 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 that, that they're connected, that, there's, that wealth is creating poverty, that, that poverty is... Oh, no, no, no I, I, don't think, I don't think the pundits that we listen to on the mainstream media ever entertain a question like that because they want to keep their jobs. They don't want to start taking people's minds and thoughts into these forbidden critical areas. So I would have to say, I don't think. What does come up is the great inequality. That, that's, that's becoming more and more evident that, um, you know, uh, people are seeing this. In the last four years, 95% of the new wealth that was created since, since, um, since 2008, 2009, the last four or five years, 95% of it has gone to the 1% up at the very top. And, and, uh, and we, the rest of us, we struggle over the other 5%. Um, so people are becoming aware of that. I mean, they're losing their jobs. They're lining up for, for jobs at Walmart where they, they make $8 an hour and they got to go get food stamps. We should congratulate ourselves for Walmart's great success. It's the richest corporation in the world and the biggest and we subsidize it we and our, with our taxes pay for the food stamps that Walmart workers cannot they don't get enough pay to feed their families so they got to go get food stamps so the Walmart success is in part subsidized by us ordinary taxpayers and um, Oh, I forgot what else I was going to say about that, but that's that's bad enough. Okay, Just let yeah, uh, let's 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 m move a little bit in, into. Uh, c can you talk a little bit about um, the the media's reticence to talk about racism, uh, the, the the purposes of of racism, racism such as it manifests itself in the in the world today, in in the United States today. Um, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about reactions to uh, the Affordable Care Act and the Republicans shutting down uh, uh, Congress. I mean, that's just shutting down the government temporarily. That just you know one tiny little manifestation compared to the others. Um, manifestation of what? Racism. Yes. Or well, racism well. as part of this. You know, the the, the for instance, working class people voting against their own uh, interests. Uh, Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis because of, of 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 racist ideas, you know that that they they're sticking it to somebody else, you know, and they get stuck at the same time. What about racism in America right now? What what purpose does it serve? What what is it? What is it up to? Right, racism has always been useful to the plutocracy, to the owning class, uh, because with racism you can divide your working class. You can. I mean, in the most the most underpaid area in America for much of the 20th century was the South, and the white workers were so worried about the black workers coming in or or or, uh, or taking my job or living too close in the neighborhood or or uh, or going to marry my daughter or some or some other thing. Um, 
uh, they're so worried about that that they couldn't join unions. There were unions that 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 could organize only up to a point, and they and then they wouldn't take in the black workers. Um, uh -huh. So uh, yeah, and so racism is very useful in in dividing the working class and and having a sub a super a super exploited configuration. People who are more exploited than even the regular workers are, and that and that was blacks or newly arrived immigrants, or women and children were both also workforces. The only thing that made women, in many instances, the only thing that made them employable, was their willingness to work at very poor, poor and exploitative wages. You see, and this was an issue that the feminist movement uh, could have given a lot more uh, attention to, I, I would think. Uh, I mean, most, most of these issues around race and gender, uh, 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 what, and especially, of course, uh, sexual preference, gays and, and, uh, and, and lesbians and all that, they get into all the lifestyle questions and issues, and they leave out how these things relate to class exploitation and class privileges. Um, so, uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how does it, how, can you talk a little bit about how the judicial system reflects uh, uh, the state of our democracy, uh, racism in America, the, you know, the prison yeah, system? Yeah, well, well, one of the things that's happened with uh, American capitalism in the last hundred years is they've really built up and strengthened the police force structure in America. Cops used to be very poorly paid. I even remember this back uh, back uh, in my youth. Um, and uh, especially in small towns and such, they were poorly paid and uh, not that well paid. But the police are now militarized. You see, the police are now... You, you have a look at a cop at, when the Occupy movement was on, and you look at these cops with a helmet and a shield and a taser yes. and a con percussion grenade and and a, and of course an automatic weapon that could mow down a, a bunch of people, tear gas. Um, you, you go on and on and 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 body body armor of all kind and they'd come into and they'd shuffle along in in formation, rows of them pushing. Oh, they'd love it. They'd love it. The power they had and beating up. Beating up the demonstrators and protesters, and that's what the, that's how they contained the Occupy movement. This was a movement that was talking about the one percent versus ninety nine percent. I mean, they were coming out and actually talking about the great divide, that one percent that owns the land, the labor, the markets, and the natural resources of the society that treats the environment like it's a septic tank and just throws out stuff just to maximize their profit. They don't care if they leave nothing but wreckage and slime and pollution behind them. And, 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 um, and, 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 the, and that Occupy movement was, was bashed by these cops. And these cops are well-paid cops now. You got it here, right here in Oakland, California. The, 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 uh, the school teachers, I think, begin at 30,000 now. Imagine that, just about... Wow. Eight or nine years ago, it was twenty-five thousand. The cops, the cops in these areas, they make, they make upwards of eighty thousand. And by the time they, at the end, of, and sometimes the end of the year with overtime and everything else, it's closer to a hundred thousand. They retire on ninety, something like ninety percent of their full salary they get when they retire, plus a three percent increase every year, two years, whatever it is. Man, they live better. I, I, I never earned anything like that with my PhD from Yale University. Big deal. Um, although there's some teachers who, get, who are getting very well paid too in, um, at the college, at the university level. Um, so so the police, the police are, are really strengthened this way. And the police have shown themselves to continually to be racist in their, in their stop and search and in beating up people 
uh, you know, we, do, we know of Melissa Alexander, is her name Melissa or Marissa, mm -hmm. I forget, who fired that one bullet in the wall because her husband was coming to beat her up and he was threatening her life. And he admitted that and then he changed the story when the trial was on. She fired one bullet into the wall and she got 20 years in prison for yes. that. It was in self-defense. Um, okay. That case is still being fought. Well, one of the things that struck but, me about the, the Occupy that's, is, is, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that certainly that they were crushed, but that, but that, that their message about the 1% and the 99% seemed to, seemed to resonate with people right away. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was, it was, it was, it, it seemed relatively simple. Uh, yes, the people right. were ready for this. They understood this. They still right. understand. Right. They this. didn't say. They didn't say. What are you talking about? You're crazy. One percent. We all have a. We all have a good chance at things, and uh, you can make your own fortune. Oh, there's still some people, by the way, as you know, still talk like that even now, even with everything you're fitting in the face. But, but you know, the, the Occupy movement came after after this big recession hit everything, and people are were feeling it. Or they saw their neighbors. They saw their they saw their towns. They saw a whole city, Detroit, sinking, going down this big sinkhole. Um, and so you you you're right there. Ed. Despite all the things thrown at them all these years and generations, I should say, they they were able to say, this system is not fair, and and we're getting ripped off, and it's it's terrible. There is a one percent, and they're getting everything. Uh, stepping back again, let's. Uh, I, I'd like to, if, if, to speak a little bit about the war against women and and the war against children. Um, um, can you speak? If, let's talk about the war against women um, and it, 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 ongoing uh, healthy war in terms of it's it's strong. I don't think it's healthy for the for any of us, but. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 got a, it's got a yeah. lot of legs. Well, before we go to women, can I just say something about law and race? Sure. That 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 black black youth, black male youth who w will get longer prison terms for drug usages, even though they've used less drugs than whites who have who have involved themselves in more drugs, have had previous offenses. They do not. They get they get shorter prison terms than blacks. I mean, they they, are, they they literally have these contracts with private prisons, and they've got to fill up those cells now. And and so the whole judicial system. You had asked about the judicial system. Yes. The whole judicial system sees black males and even females, uh, with the Alexander case, for instance, and and, and, are, and are throwing them in jail at an outrageous. And, 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 and it can only it can only be explained by this double standard that, that you know yes yes moving that yeah and with women um, well uh, I think the studies the studies that we've seen show that women have a have, have a greater burden of proof than men do in many instances uh, women are the women's first victimizer is men. Uh, women in America are beaten, they're killed, they're terrorized, they're intimidated, they're they're held down, um, and overwhelmingly the cases involve a husband or a boyfriend or some male figure in the family who's doing this to them, and and that kind of stuff has to stop. And um, and they say this knows no racial boundaries, and this knows no uh, no class boundaries. But you know it does. It, it really does. That people who are poorer often have a tougher time of it, and the law comes down much harder on them too. It, it seems to be so easy to uh, to well the, the example of. The war on women to 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 push those buttons to to, to they're, they're so easily activated these fears these angers these uh, um, well I you know the 
let's move on. I mean, I don't know it, it, the, 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 the situation, vis the sexual situation vis-a-vis -vis men and women, uh, or the power situation, it, it seems so easy. Well, I guess women have been scapegoats for a long time. Um, right. That's their traditional role. Uh, and and a, a, let's add to that this, this war against children. One of the people that came on our show, an educator, uh, I was really shocked, although apparently I should have known this, that in, uh, in many of the school systems, in the New York City school system, for instance, in poor districts, they've taken recess out of the, out of the, out of the school. They're not, they don't have recess anymore. Uh, yep. They just study for the test, they, or they, you know, they focus on the test. More and more ways to, to make school onerous for children, to limit what they learn, uh, you know, aside from taking away their food stamps. Um, it, it's just, just, just kind of very straightforward, uh, merciless uh, uh, lining up who's going to succeed and who isn't going to succeed in the future? Yes. Yes. Um, well, and it's ironic with women in, in the Army, for instance, in military services, here are women who have gone in to serve the empire itself, to become centurions of the empire. And some colossal, colossal number, like, what is it? I, I, I read one place, I don't know if it's true, but 40% of all the women who are in the military have been raped or seriously compromised or molested in some way and all that. I've and without, those kind of figures too. And they're getting no recourse because, the, like any institution, the Army just covers it up, like the church covers up their pedophiles and, and the like. They they just don't want this to go out and look bad and make the make the division or the company or or this particular service look bad, and um, and the women who do try to fight it and come forth themselves then get penalized for it, that, which is one of the great accomplishments of Barack Obama in his war against whistleblowers, that people who expose these corruptions and such instead of being rewarded are treated like um, like criminals, and Obama has been uh, uh, one of the worst. It seems to me. It seems like it, it seems like in, in Obama's case, it's like it's 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 a very clearly a, a war against whistleblowers. But there's, there's some subtleties that he's thrown in there that make it that can make it hard to see, except the facts are right in front of your face. Uh, the way that he, the way that he. The way that he talks, the way that he, the, the, the rationalness of his, of his, of his demeanor, um, it, it's, I find it scary because he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful front man for this stuff. Um, he, he is wonderful, yeah. He's, he, he really serves the ruling class wonderfully. And he serves them with all his loving heart. I mean, he really likes the Republicans. His first meeting, when he was first elected, his first meeting with any a uh, component in Congress was a, a group of Republicans, House Republicans, I think. He just loves it. When when they took out that, that uh, abolitionist, the statue of the abolitionist in the rotunda at Capitol Hill in the Capitol, mm. they took it out to make room to put Ronald Reagan's statue there. You could see Barack Obama ushering in Nancy Reagan to, you know, whatever she does, cut the ribbon on the statue or something. And he just had this joy and look on, on his face as he walked with her and smiling down at her. This guy wants to be, and he is a servant of the reactionary class. He salutes the, the flags that are on those coffins that come back from one of his three or four or five wars or military actions of one sort or another. And he's there. You don't see that too often anymore, all this grandstanding. He does the same phony thing that Ronald Reagan did. He salutes. You yes. have no right to salute if you're in civilian clothes. This this salute is a salute only for military personnel. And you, you can no, no ex-military guys, the war veterans, they put their hand on their chest like that. Uh, but he but he salutes. He puts that salute and he pulls down the corners of his mouth. He's acting his way through the presidency, same way that. Um, Ronald Reagan did. He's the biggest phony. I can't, I really can't take him seriously. And he's got, and of course you have African Americans in this country who, who got the, their bet on this guy that he's got to make it, he's got to make it, he's got to be a successful president. The only thing worse than not having 
a, a, a black president is having a black president who fails. And a lot of these right-wingers who claim we're not racist and such, uh, the vehemence with which they attack him, you, of course, you've got to, uh, you, you got to wonder. Um, and he keeps leaning over, leaning over toward the right, and they keep pulling the right further and further right and more extreme, so that the center of political gravity keeps moving over more and more to the right. Um, and Obama is a good one. He's a good guy. To, uh, he, he gives them what they want. He got. He gets that. You know the the uh, defense, the law. The law that says that, that that says we can arrest anybody in times of emergency without any charges, without any evidence, without uh, any trial or anything. Uh, and he said, "Don't worry, I won't use that." Oh, thanks a lot. You won't use it. Um, yes, so, sir. so I have no use for him. I just have. I mean, but they, but the ruling class has use for him. He does very well for them. Yes, He's I remember that. I remember that kind of Roman Colosseum thing that he had at, at, just after he got elected. We're we're about a minute away from, and it, it was already, you know, it 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 already spelled it out <laughs> what was going to happen here. Uh, um, we um, so. So listen to 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 tie this. Where where I never know how to do these things. I'm looking at this clock here. We're 37 seconds from the end of this conversation. Um, I want to remind. Well, we, we've covered democracy. We've covered um, uh, uh, class struggle, and we've covered racism and gender and a number of other things. The last two things. I think we did pretty well in the okay. Okay. All right. Then we did pretty well. Okay. So, so thank you, Michael Parenti, for joining us on the facts. Um, it, it was a pleasure. Um, um, thank you very much. He's coming in from Skype. If you don't know Skype from Berkeley, California. Uh, this is Lenore von Stein. Good night, everybody. <laughs>